Welcome, everyone, to the next episode of the Barrel Up Podcast. As you guys know, the Barrel Up Podcast is all about the mystifying the topic of money and sharing powerful money stories from people who truly beat the odds. Today, we have Rajat Sony, CFA, and he is the owner, founder, and owner of Rajat Sony Finance. The cool thing about Rajat is that he is an Ontario, Canada based personal finance coach, professional. He has a history of working at one of the biggest financial firms in Canada, being TD Ameritrade. As a fixed income analyst, basically he is very smart and he's great at just analyzing bonds, which for you might be, hey, like it's incredibly boring, but for someone like Rajat, that's something he loves to do. And then I mentioned that he's a CFA charter holder, which you have the CFA, Certified Financial Planner, right? Certified CFP, Certified Financial Planner. You have CFA, a chartered, I always screw up the acronym. Help me with this one. Financial Analyst. Chartered Financial Analyst, uh, Charter Holder. Basically, he had to go through three different exams that are all very rigorous, and most people don't even get past level number one. He got through all three and now he has the letters. So welcome, Rajat. Welcome to the Bear Wild Podcast and thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for welcoming me on here. Definitely looking forward to talking to you about this. Just in advance, I feel like just having the CFA, I feel like it doesn't really make you smarter than the average person. I think the process is just like anything else. Consistency is key. So. Yeah. I just like to give credit where credit is due because yeah, I, you. <laughs> I've got my buddies who like went through the CFA exam. They either got past level number one and didn't get mm. past level number two or oh, they yeah. just didn't get past level number, number one yeah. at all. I'd mm. argue, and you can correct me if I'm wrong because I can't think of any other exam. It may be the hardest exam in all of finance. I believe so. I think it took me 600 hours of studying for the second exam. The second exam was just brutal. I feel like it was insane it, it, it goes like with level one you don't go very deep but with level mm-hmm. two you go so deep you know all you have to know all the nuances if you don't know any of the details you're kind of done so yeah and isn't there like a written version there um, is so level like three is level written two level three is written yeah yeah so that's that's where they would have got me kind of which yeah like, you know what yeah, you I'm can't you can't that. fake it when you when it's a written exam you can't just get that one in three chance right passing. exactly you actually well, have to know exactly what you're doing if you don't know what you're doing I, you, you're not gonna make it through it's unfortunate well, you can't you won't pass well congratulations and uh, i look forward to tapping into your knowledge during the episode but before we tap into your brain let's go into the icebreaker question that I did not pre- prepare you for i never prepare you for this question but here we go so don't get nervous are you sitting down are you ready yeah, I'm ready. Cool, let's get into it. The icebreaker question is, if you could only have one app on your phone, only one, that's not phone or iMessage, if you have an iPhone. If you're not team iPhone, you should get an iPhone. If it's not those two apps, what is one, and let's take out Instagram as well, okay? I know you're on there heavy. What yeah. would be the app that you would want to have on your iPhone if it's not iMessage, if it's not the phone, and if it's not Instagram? Oh, YouTube. YouTube for sure. YouTube? Um, yeah. The reason for that is because I, I, I learned so much on there, man. It's I pay for the premium service. I'm not trying to plug it, but the reason why I pay for it is because of the downloads. I, I feel like those downloads, when you're driving, when you're on a commute, having downloads, having videos downloaded, just like it, it, you can learn so much within that. Like, let's say, for example, I were to go somewhere for an hour. In that hour, I can learn so much about whatever topic I want to learn about. I mean, you can you can find lectures on nuclear physics if you wanted. Yeah. You can literally learn anything these days. And they, they break it down. Them. If you find a, a good creator or like someone who's like a really good instructor, they yeah. could break it down where you could understand how to go about doing it. I totally agree. I mean, books and YouTube, I mean, they there's so much information packed in there. Yeah. Even podcasts, so much information packed in there and like I'd argue that if I could go back to college and do something over again, it would probably like I, I, I appreciate the time that I had in college and I needed to be at college for the environment that I was trying to escape and like the development that I needed. Yeah. However, if I had that development and I had a better environment and I mentioned this on another episode. I probably just would binge watch YouTube videos on finance or whatever topic that I'm interested in and read a lot of books. Yeah. Like 
if there was a college that did that and allowed you just to watch free YouTube videos and pay a little bit for like books where you can read them yourself for yeah. a topic that you really cared about, I'd probably lean towards that. If there I think what I would, I think what I would like would be, I, I think this could could actually, this could probably change how education works forever. Let's say you had a curriculum where they gave you the structure for everything, mm -hmm. and they just gave you videos to watch instead of. I mean, those videos can be created by a professor. Or those videos can be created on YouTube by the best creators that are around the world. But I mean, if they just gave you a curriculum and charged you for that curriculum, I think that could be a great, great model. I totally agree. And right. I think eventually we're going to move into something like that. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the Googles or the Amazons of the world or hell, like a, a Vanguard, right? They already have like a Vanguard university. So if you go no. to oh, Vanguard, yeah, and stuff, right? and, yeah, and you, you go to Vanguard University, that's basically like their training development for like new employees. I'd argue what I learned during that time, if you could package that up and create a university out of it, you could charge a significantly less amount of money than the universities. Yeah. They can clean up, completely it's clean up. And people would learn more about their pers personal finances than they would if they actually got a degree in economics or finance yeah. at a university. I totally believe that the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples of the, of the world, they're going to create their own universities, significantly decrease the price. Yeah. And the way I, and you might think differently, but the way I look at it is if I'm looking at a resume and I'm trying to bring someone into my financial firm and they either went to Ontario Tech, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's a thing, yeah. or they got a very prestigious certification from Google in finance, I probably would go with the Google person. Yeah. You see where I'm going? Like yeah. a lot of people go to like these universities and I'm not trying to you know, shit on any of the other universities out there, but if it's not a university that the hiring manager doesn't recognize, you are probably better off, in my opinion, going to Google University being like an actual formal program or Amazon right. University, because people are going to recognize that you have that brand recognition. Like I was privileged enough to go to a university that like everyone knows is being Penn State, like it's an international program. And their global program is like one of the best. Mm -hmm. But if I went to State College Tech, which is like not a real school, but yeah. if the college had where Penn State is at had a technical school, I'd probably be better off like getting a degree from a business. But anyhow, yeah. I'm going that tangent forever. And like, yeah, I agree you know. with you. I, I think that's actually true. I, I, I would, I would personally rather go through Google because they have that reach to get the best professors around the world. Right. Exactly. And who would say no to Google saying, Hey, like, can you come in and teach a lesson on digital marketing online? Right. On like, I, I totally would say yes. Yeah. I mean, and if you think about it, the the model could be a lot cheaper than regular universities too right because you just pay them royalties exactly like yeah i think you want to pay them royalties forever i i think we're on to something so yeah. google amazon apple if you take our idea you better pay us royalties <laughs> you're finance people and we'll come after <laughs> don't come after us <laughs> yeah Raja, if if you could for the audience for anyone who's like i don't know who the hell this guy is like Give a little bit of your background. Tell us a little bit more. Oh, give us a little bit more about your background and then also tell us more about your platform online. Yes. Okay. So I worked in, in the finance industry for seven years. I helped people. I, I've seen people go from having like a 500 credit score all the way up to just like while I've, while I've been dealing with them, going up to like a 700, 800 credit score. I've dealt with people who have claimed bankruptcy, people who are trying to get loans and they have terrible credit and they, they're paying like 30% on their on their personal loan, personal line of credit. So I, oh, during my career, I learned all of these all of these things that people are doing wrong. And mm -hmm. a lot of these mistakes are repeated constantly by people who just don't know that they're mistakes, right? So people are taking on credit card debt. Or, I mean, I used to, I, used, I did it before as well. So I know that there's... I know there's a, a gap in knowledge around the world. I mean, everybody, I think, I think a majority of people don't know much about personal finance. They, they, they're not able to invest the time into learning. So my, my goal was with this platform to help the 
I guess, average person learn about、mm-hmm. personal finance. Previously, my roles were more helping people, helping millionaires become richer, right? So, right. Like, we, we would、Same、have,、way. yeah, we'd be dealing with, we'd be dealing with portfolios from insurance companies or endowments or just really rich individuals. Who had $10 million, $15 million, $400 million sitting in a portfolio. And、right. all we're doing is we're investing those portfolios into bonds so that they can make a little bit more interest. But I mean, even if they make a million dollars in a year in their bond portfolio, I mean, it's not as it's not as fulfilling as helping somebody pay off a $2,000 credit card. I totally agree. Because like, not only are you helping those. Multi millionaires become multi multi millionaires, or whatever you want、yeah. to define it, or maybe approaching billionaire status.、Yeah. But, like, what got it from me? And you probably, I, I, I remember looking at your background, but I don't remember if you were there in 2020.、Um, but during the pandemic, that's when I was like, what am I doing? And when the market was taking a nosedive, you know, a lot of people were losing money on paper, but they were freaking. Out. A lot of the rich people were freaking out. I get why. I think people thought the earth was like caving in, whatever.、Yeah. But when you deal with, when you try to provide solutions to rich people, you also have to deal with rich people problems. And their problems aren't real problems. And what、yeah. got me was when I was talking to one of my cousins who happens to be a doctor in New York, and she was telling me about. The amount of people who were like just passing away from COVID and、yeah. dying, she's like, that's a problem. This is a problem. Like people who need emergency help or they're, they're in the hospice and they're by themselves like during COVID. And that really just reset it for me. And, and I was like, what, Mark, what are you doing? Like, how are you actually helping? And at that moment, that's when I really started to double. We were talking about this before the recording, but that's when I started doubling down on my content because I was just like, I want to help people who actually truly have a problem, right? You were mentioning credit card debt, people are losing jobs, people who might not have an emergency fund, right? All these things that lead to these generational curses. It's like, how are we helping those folks? So I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because we're now at a point where we're helping the average person. I call them dreamers, right? Dreamers go and invest instead of helping millionaires become multimillionaires. So I appreciate、yeah. you. Joining me in this in this journey, of course, of course. I, I mean, it's been it's been a lot more fulfilling. I've been, I think, I've been working more than I was working before. Yeah, but I think it's worth it, right? I mean, I, I think with, I think with when you have personal finance social media account, I think you need to address a lot of mainstream finance issues、mm-hmm. that are happening. Like, let's say, for example, the bank collapses. Yeah. If we weren't paying attention to what's going on. We wouldn't be able to post about that, right? I mean, you're pretty、right. much on 24 7. Yep. Right. Yeah, so you, you constantly are. And, and to your point, it's like, this is passion, right? Instead of like working a job nine to five, right? I was talking to a buddy the other day who was like, man, like you're constantly working. I was like, but I don't feel like I'm working. Yeah. I feel like I'm actually doing a good deed and I just so happen to get paid for it. <laughs> like,、yeah. you know,、yeah. I have the best job in the world, right? Like, I'm yeah, helping people、exactly. with their finances. The way, the, way I, the way that I like to think about it is that we're learning and then we're spreading our knowledge. Right, exactly. It's like each, my whole thing is each one teach one, right? So、yeah. for me, it's like I can teach you all this information, but the best thing you can ever possibly do is go and teach someone else what、yeah. I just talked about, right?、Yeah. Because then that person can hopefully go and teach their kids or grandkids or whatever it might be, their friends. And that's how we make the world a better place. And I'm happy、yeah. it's happening not only in the United States, but also in Canada、uh, with you. Honestly,、uh, we have, we have、uh, combined what? Almost three, four hundred thousand followers. Yep. Those, keep in mind that those followers have created their own pages、mm-hmm. after seeing what we've posted and they're reaching out to their own network, right?、That's、so it's、true. viral, right? The, the financial knowledge, any kind of knowledge, when you have the internet, you can scale it. You can. Totally agree. Yeah, a lot of people. Finances without much effort. I totally agree. Yeah, people were able to go and, and change their finances, but you're right. Like, as they're going and they're improving their finances, then, you know, they're probably going to go and create a page as well. Say, hey, like, you know, I want to teach people something、yeah. similar, maybe my own take. And luckily,、yeah. over the years, I, there's a whole host of very, very large Instagram pages that. Said, hey, Mark, like I got started because you got started. And we're talking、yeah. about、um, beforehand, like I got started because Jeremy got started. And I like what he was doing over at Personal Finance Club. 
but I had a different spin. And I also wanted to represent my, my folks, my culture as well, because it's not often you see someone who is African-American who's like coming on and talking about personal finance and also really truly caring about their money. And we're not talking day trading, we're talking about strategies that actually work. So it, it it's definitely a humbling experience to just talk to people like that who are yeah. just like, yeah, like I wouldn't have gotten started if it wasn't for you. So like, I, I'm incredibly grateful for that. So like, let's kind of go back in time man. like, uh, tell me a little bit about your upbringing, how your, how your family might have focused or didn't focus on money. Uh, so I, I think we, we kept it more like my, my parents kept it to themselves. They didn't really yeah. talk to us that much about, about personal finance, about how to deal with our personal finances. I mean, it wasn't their fault, right? I mean, they, they didn't think that they needed to, to teach us. I mean, it was, I don't blame them at all. Yeah. I, I think it's more like, I, I think within, within the South Asian community, mm-hmm. there's, I think money is more of a taboo topic, mm-hmm. right? Most people don't. Uh, luckily my wife her family talks about money constantly right i mean they they um the she's actually the one who got me to start saving start paying off my debts if it hadn't if she hadn't pushed me towards it i wouldn't have started learning more right i I wouldn't have started um making an effort to to create these this content that i create Um, uh but i i in my upbringing i mean we didn't really we didn't really think about opportunity costs we didn't think about sunk costs we didn't think about uh, interest. We didn't think about investing pretty much at all. Right. I mean, you keep in mind that the the currency really only started losing losing value a lot faster over the more recent years. Mm-hmm. And that's when I when I I guess became an adult and started learning on my own. But before that, I feel like as much as it would have helped to start learning earlier, I don't think it was as important back then as it is right now. Totally agree. Right. It's interesting you bring it up. I definitely believe that in high school and college, I think it should be part of the curriculum. But I would argue that people don't truly start caring until yeah. maybe after 25, right yeah. after you make some financial mistakes. Yeah. Like That's a different type of learning. If you have to learn and everything's all good, chances are you're not going to learn everything you need to know um, right. or be able to navigate through really tough situations. But when you're at rock bottom, like I was living paycheck to paycheck, like not, you know, my investment portfolio was in the negatives, right? Like I was doing all the terrible things. It wasn't until I hit the point where I was like, wait, if I continue to do this for the rest of my life, I'm just going to live the same life that my parents live, where they just struggle with money, struggle with debt. We had bill collectors calling, right? I didn't want to do that. So at yeah. that point, at my rock bottom, that's when I started making the changes. But you're totally right. Again, like I think it's important to learn at that time. That way you know the context of the world and you understand like, okay, well, here's right from wrong or here's what I should be doing. But you're truly not going to care until you get to that that um, to that to point where it's a rock bottom. I yeah, also want to mention oh, how sorry. important it is to... I don't, I don't find, want to oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, and just I'll yeah. end with this and I'll let you go. Yeah. Um, how important it is to find a good spouse. Your spouse is like your number one decision, like the most yeah. important decision you can ever make. And the fact that she was able to wrap you into all that and she truly cared about your money and your, you know, her money and your money collectively. I mean, it's really saying something about how much I'm sure you value her. Yeah. And then how much she values you in terms of like finance and just your your personal background, your personal finance background. Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't want to forget about this point. I was actually mm-hmm. looking at the Ontario curriculum, the education curriculum. They they added a personal finance section, but again, mm-hmm. there's nothing about investing. Wow. It talks yeah. about, talks about how to differentiate between different bills and coins, what money is, and they I mean they specifically say, oh this is the only thing that's money and then they don't really talk about anything else so it doesn't really it doesn't really pique people's interest because they don't know that they can make money without having to work for it right like they don't think of it as money working for you you know i had a a really eye-opening opportunity to go up to the bronx new york which the bronx is one of the boroughs in new york and i went to like up to an academy and they were just they were called it was called teach fest and at no teach jam is what it was called 
and during which they were talking about a bunch of different financial topics but we're talking to teachers about it with the hopes that they will go and talk to the students about it. Mm. And what they brought up, and I, I thought it was interesting, and I want to make sure I'm wording this correctly. Teachers are incredibly smart. They're brilliant. They're caring, right? But for a topic like personal finance, unless you've gone through it yourself or you've studied it to the T, it's a really hard topic to talk about. Yeah. Um, it's not like art or like, it's not like math or something of that nature where it's like finite, but finance can just be really, really tough. Investing can be tough. So like as much as these states or provinces want to include that within the curriculum, it really comes down to if the teacher feels comfortable actually talking about that and delivering what they should be delivering to the students right and i know that if i were a, a teacher and i didn't know anything about finance i'd struggle having that conversation uh, someone might bring up does day trading work i'm gonna be like i don't i don't know right but if someone asked me hey like you know what are your thoughts on if i was like a, a social studies teacher and they're asking me you know what are my thoughts on like world war ii or you know what actually happened in this specific battle, right? Like you can look that stuff up and yeah. it's pretty funny. Like, okay, X, Y, and Z happened. But with the finance, it's like, okay, well, if I invest this much money over this course of time into this investment, you know, what could possibly happen? You know, you can't really answer that question as easily. So, um, and during that time, that's when I said, hey, like maybe there's an opportunity for professionals like us to come in and teach those students and just be like a guest lecturer yeah. So that's one thing that we uh, we end up landing with, but it's like connecting the two, right? It's like not only the ability to deliver that information, which the teachers are amazing at and cater to their students, but it's also the knowledge base and yeah. knowing people who actually know more things about finance. So that's, I think once they're able to unravel that, not only within Canada and the United States, I think we'll be in a better spot. But until then, we're going to try to work it out. And within the United States, there are a bunch of states that are agreeing to add it into the curriculum. But that's my concern is that are they teaching them the right things? Right. So they can actually go and implement that throughout their lives. And then hopefully they never get to the point where they're maxing out their credit cards or they're in debt up to their eyeballs or they right. you know, don't know how to budget money. So that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I know. I agree 100%. I feel like even for myself, I, I mean, I have the CFA, I have an accounting and finance background. I didn't really learn all of the stuff that I teach mm. at school, though, right? Yeah. I, a majority of the stuff that I teach was either learned at work or mm -hmm. through experience, right? I mean, like, I would have if I if I just went straight from school to, to doing this, I would probably add a fraction of the value that I add today. Right. Like I would yeah. have no idea what uh, I would have no idea what a GIC or a, a, a CD is. Right. A, a CD, a certificate of deposit. I would have no no clue what that is. Right. Are gigs still around? Break down gigs for everyone. Uh, are they still around? Or do people still oh, use yeah. them? So nice. GICs are in Canada. GICs are basically they're guaranteed income certificates. It's basically like a short term, almost a short term bond. Yeah. That you're giving where you're basically lending money to the bank and let's say cds are certificates of deposit that's global gic i think is specific to canada so canada started calling it a gic for whatever, for whatever reason i think there's other countries that call it a gic as well but in general it's called a cd certificate of deposit so basically what you're doing is you're lending a bank money let's say you bank uh, you lend them five thousand dollars what you're getting is a fixed rate of return but your money is locked in so let's say you don't need the money for a, a year or two years. You can buy a two-year GIC that's going to pay you premium compared to the uh, the rate of return for like a checking account or a high yield savings account. It's going to give you a little bit of a premium because you're locking your money away. You have no right. access to use that money, right? So there's a chance that you may not be able to use that money because let's say you pass away, for example, you're getting paid for that risk. Exactly. No, it's a it, it's really interesting that you call it a GIC because there's a a vehicle, an investment vehicle that used to be called a GIC that I don't think exists anymore within the United States, but you're saying oh. that GIC is a CD, which yes. is a certificate of deposit in Canada, yes. which I think is fascinating. And for anyone who's listening that you're like, hey, like this sounds like a good idea. 
he brought up and what I think is really important that you want to pay attention to is that you basically have to agree that over a defined period of time that you don't need that money. Yes. Right. Because I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I can get a high amount of interest and it seems like there's no, you know, apparent risk. I'm going to do that. But the challenge is if you don't have your finances together and not learning from, you know, both Rajat and me, if you don't have your finances together, then you might be at a point where you say, okay, well, I need to actually dip into this money and use it for whatever. I lost my job, whatever. If you're at that point, or if you think that, you know, you need that money within the next couple of years, you probably don't want to do that because what happens is you will lose out on, they'll, they'll basically penalize you and charge a fee for you pulling that money out early. Yes. So, the, so from the bank standpoint, you have to remember the bank's like, listen, you give me money. I hold said money. I pay you interest, but you can't give and then try to take back within a defined period of time. Cause we're going to try to put this to work and do other things. Right. Cause if everyone was doing that, then they would not have a business. Right. Exactly. So that's just how it works. It just, it's basically just a way to tie your assets with your liabilities. Right. Cause yeah. you know, that way that uh, like, let's say for example, with Silicon Valley bank, the reason why Silicon Valley bank collapsed was because their assets that they bought with client deposits weren't matched with their liability so that the, mm -hmm. the time the timings of both the time horizons of both didn't match right you had 30-year bonds versus checking account balances that can be withdrawn right away so mm -hmm. when people tried to take those that money out and the value of those bonds had dropped silicon valley could silicon valley bank couldn't fulfill withdrawals so they, they do still have their assets it's just that the assets aren't tied to the 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 time horizon for the assets isn't time, tied, tied to the time horizon for the liability. So exactly what you said, when you have something that you need to spend, like, like you have to pay for rent at the end of this month, you don't want to be owning GIC that it's going to expire or it's going to mature in six months. Right. Right. Exactly. That's like the perfect way to, to think about it. And I like that you compared it to Silicon Valley Bank. That's exactly what happened. Right. But I thought what's really interesting is that there are, there were a lot of banks that fell into that same category. A lot of them were either saved or, you know, they didn't get hit as hard. And luckily the contagion didn't spread, but it's like a common case of like, or a typical case of what used to work no longer works. We're in a different world now, right? Where social media could help spread the contagion to a point where the banks are going down, share prices are falling, right? And that's exactly, to your point, that's exactly what happened. They were saying, okay, well, we've always done this and it should continue to work. And I can't imagine a time where that could happen where people would just try and pull out all their money, but it happened, right? People pulling out their money, runs at the bank, you know, started happening and yeah. people were freaking out, share prices were falling. And then, oh, by the way, like their bond prices were, you know, shit as well. Or their bond value was shit as well. So yeah. that's it just makes for a horrible combination. Luckily, it didn't spread to the entire banking system, but it got kind of scary there for a little bit. When you have a digital currency, when your platform is digital, is mm -hmm. that people can withdraw as much money as they want. When your right. money is physical, they have a limit because banks can obviously say, hey, we don't have this much currency on hand. So come back tomorrow. They can easily refill it, right? But when mm -hmm. you have digital deposits, when everything is digital, somebody can do a wire transfer for a million dollars. And if right. you don't have a million dollars, then you're done. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely fascinating, like the world that we live in now compared to what it was before, where, yeah, you had to get physical cash. You couldn't just press a couple of buttons, get your money out. But yeah, luckily, everything was it seems to be <laughs> like everything's taken care of. Yeah, just another case of. The, the world just being different. One thing that we, we talked about uh, for the audience that we talked about before the recording was just the difference or maybe similarities of a Canadian consumer and Canadian investor to the United States consumer and investor. And we were talking about a couple different topics, but when, when it comes down to Canadian consuming, maybe we can start there. How would you say Canadian consuming is different from? I think in general, they're about the same. Mm. Because, I mean, it's it's human nature, right? You always want more. Your desires can, are endless, while 
you have to think about the opportunity cost, right? So, I mean, you can, you can have, you can buy anything, but you probably won't be able to afford it. So, I mean, I think it's the same. I think the, the main similarity between them is that they're both willing to go into debt to buy whatever mm-hmm. they want. And that, that, I mean, again, for both, that's a big problem because I mean, they, they, once they're in that debt, they can't get back out. It's, it's right. very similar because I mean, we're, we're allowing people to take on as much debt as they want. I mean, think about it for student loans, people are taking on hundreds of thousands for weddings. Somebody can take on $50,000 of debt for a, a few hours of, of enjoyment, right? I mean, it's for a party, you're paying 50, 60 grand and you're paying it off for the rest of your life for a few hours of enjoyment. I mean, mm. it, it, it's the same. I think it's the same all over. I, I think in general though, because the U S has more options because a majority, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of small businesses in Canada are taken down by monopolies. So in the U S I think there's a lot more options. So in Canada, we're kind of forced to pay more for the necessities while in the U S you can, I think there's a little bit lower of a cost, but we, again, I mean, there's in general, they're pretty similar, but I mean, there, there's going to be nuances that I probably don't understand. Don't know. Yeah, no, that brings up a really good point. I mean, I remember watching a, um, I don't even want to call it a documentary. It was kind of like a movie that was talking about, and I'm, I'm a big history person. I like to understand why we get into situations that we're in now, like, or how we got in the situation we're in now yeah. based off of like history. And they were just talking about JP Morgan Sr. and JP Morgan Jr. Just talking about how they partnered with the auto industry to provide like car loans and that was like one of the first times if not the first time that they started offering car loans to people who basically couldn't afford a car but before that when you would go and you would try to buy a ford car whatever like you had to actually have the money right so like it was important that you had access to capital or you knew someone who had access to capital then it got to the point where it's like people who have the things they had access to credit and JP Morgan came together with, you know, Ford and all the other dealerships uh, in uh, or car manufacturers in, in Detroit and said, well, what if they could afford it? What if we could have them make payments and then pay us interest forever because they want said product, but yeah. they are not willing to wait. And I thought it was just so interesting because like for them, from a business standpoint, it made sense. It was like, well, they can afford it we can help them afford it so if we can help them afford it, they have access to that capital then can they actually afford it and the answer is yes right so then that started um the the boom of the car manufacturing and like everything you know what happened in, in, in detroit and it just like blew up obviously like the jp morgans and the lenders and who had access everyone who had access to capital those people got filthy rich. I mean, they're still rich today, right? And then the you know, people had those cars, but they also went into a lot of debt. Debt is what helped to really grow the United States to what it was, the roaring 20s, right? All that stuff was all, a lot of it was funding, funded by debt. And I thought that was just really fascinating because now we're at a point now where it's like not only auto loans, it's mortgages, it's literally anything. You can yeah. finance anything. And even buy now, pay later is debt. Yes. Yeah. You don't give the same name, right? You don't think of it as being credit, but like that is debt that you are taking on. So I thought all that was like really fascinating, just knowing the origin of auto loans. Right. I, I mean, right now you can even, I think you can even finance a pizza. Yeah. You can finance. Yeah. I went to, I went to get a, a to upgrade my phone not too long ago. You can finance a phone case, which is 30 bucks. Wow. So, I mean, it, it's pretty crazy when you when you think about it that way. I, I feel like it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to go into debt for something that you're going to consume. But I mean, I, I know there's situations where you're forced to. You may mm-hmm. not. I mean, otherwise you may be homeless or you may right. not be able to pay for food, right? But I mean, there's in general. I think if you can avoid debt, avoid it as much as possible. Even even if you think about it. The housing market popped off, but a lot of the demand for houses isn't real. It's mortgages, right? right? So, I mean, it's people before 
you had no mortgage, you'd buy a house for like seven hundred dollars, you'd pay it off right away. But yeah. now, I mean, it's somebody somebody can if they can't afford that seven hundred dollars, or right now, I mean, it's seven hundred thousand. But back then, it was seven, the prices prices have increased because there's more demand. But the price right. you can create the money faster than you can create the assets. So right. when, you can, when you can do that, obviously the money is going to decrease in value because people there's there's gonna be more of it supply and demand as right. supply goes up demand goes down prices go down i mean it, it, it's it's basic economics but yeah a lot of people don't really seem to understand how that ties in to the increased cost of living totally agree what i'm looking for right now is i you know in this conversation i remember seeing an article about the debt that the United States is in. And I think we just approached a really big milestone. Here it is. So one hour ago from the NY uh, New York Fed, um, mm. credit card debt hits record. A second indicator in less than a week shows that Americans have racked up $1 trillion in credit card debt. Yeah. Very timely, right? $1 trillion in credit card debt. And to your point, there's a whole lot of reasons on why that could happen. You have inflation, things are getting more expensive, right? People are losing their jobs, right? Because the Fed is trying to increase rates to basically help people get unemployed, uh, which is another conversation. But there are a lot of people who I believe are still COVID spending, right? They're, they're trying to make up for that year, two years of not be able to travel, not be able to do yeah. certain things, which all by me, like, Trust me, like I'm probably adding to that where I'm going and I'm traveling, whatever, right? But you have to get to the point where you say, okay, well, what is what is enough, right? What like how am I going and how am I affording my lifestyle? And if you feel like you're affording your lifestyle because of a credit card, then you're probably not doing it correctly. And it's a very slippery slope. Like my the hardest part of my financial journey was paying off my credit card. And it yeah. was because as soon as I paid it off, like it was bad. <laughs> I would pay off a thousand dollars and then I'd be like, perfect. Like I have a little bit more to go. And then I'd be like, you know what? I'm out. I'm having fun. I'm like maybe at the mall, whatever. I now have another thousand dollars that I can use in order to pay for whatever. Right. And that's yeah. how I continue to like max out my credit card. Luckily it didn't like kill my credit, but that's why it was tough. It wasn't until I cut that credit card up and say so I'm not using it anymore until I get my shit together that I end up going paying off that debt. Now you know, I, I keep it to a manageable level. Yes. Um, I mean, if, if you know, if you notice a lot of, uh, a lot of retailers are offering their own credit cards because mm -hmm. there's money to be made. Right. I mean, I, I was, I was watching, I was watching a video or reading something where they were saying uh, how a lot of the airlines now aren't making money from flying their planes i mean they're making money from lending money they're, they're making more money from their credit cards that they're that they're giving people than they are from actual flights which is crazy yeah yeah i mean as a as a cfa charter holder and someone who knows debt and credit and interest rates more than the average person do you believe that we're approaching a bubble a credit bubble if you will or maybe yeah, I, I think so. I, I feel like you would speak to that. <laughs> I I think so. I don't want to. I don't want to fear monger. I don't want to scare people. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm of the opinion that the debt that even the U.S. has, it can't pay it back, right. and it's only a matter of time before people figure it out, right? I mean, I was watching. Uh, do you know who Greg Foss is? Yeah, uh, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. Greg Foss. He's a he's a Bitcoin guy. So mm -hmm. he was saying something about how. Uh, he's he was an institutional bond investor before he got into Bitcoin. So he was saying how um, the U.S. has 200 trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. That means like um, uh, pensions, uh, Social Security, Medicare. Not not sure. I'm not sure exactly what falls into that, mm -hmm. but it's basically everything that they owe over the next 30, 40, 50 years to people who are going to retire. This, just social programs. Where's that two hundred trillion dollars going to come from? Right. You can either increase taxes, they can sell more bonds, or they can print more money. Right. And like they'll go out and try to print more money. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly what it is, right? I mean, before 
the 30 trillion dollars that we hear about all the time that's money that the us was able to lend to um let's say uh, china or japan or russia or whoever they lend it to but now the us is in a situation where those countries aren't buying the bonds anymore mm-hmm. right those bonds are being bought by the federal reserve So right. when the Federal Reserve buys bonds, the Federal Reserve doesn't have any assets. It just buys bonds. It has a balance sheet. It it it, it doesn't keep any reserves. All it does is it keeps those it keeps those assets on its balance sheet and then it 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 uh try it, I guess it produces creates more money and then it gives it to the treasury to spend. So whenever those whenever the the Federal Reserve is buying those bonds to keep the interest rates on the market at a certain level, they're adding more money to the money supply they're adding more cash and they're increasing inflation right and right. i mean everything that let's say for example i think the the new budget for the us came out and the budget for military spending is almost a trillion dollars wow and that money is not money that they're going to get back right that's a consumption item right i mean the the goal it's to protect i guess it's to protect the country but i mean I mean at the end of the day I I think that it's more about having control over the rest of the world keeping keeping everybody using the US dollar mm. that's what the military is pretty much enforcing. Yeah. No, it's a really I mean it's a tough topic. Um you know growing up, you know where I grew up, I know a lot of people are very passionate. I mean I grew up in a military family as well where I I get the argument but I would say that there's a lot of line items that we have within the US budget where you could probably argue that it's not necessarily like needed yes for just like the everyday yeah. um so that's why i appreciate like there 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 are two sides when it comes to just politics with the united states you have like the liberals and you have like the conservatives and like sometimes people will say like we don't need the liberals or like the liberals say we don't need the conservatives i argue that both sides serve their purpose um and if we can come together and we can yeah. actually try to figure this thing out using both viewpoints which hopefully few like future presidential candidates and you know, nominees or whatever like they end up doing that um i think that can help solve the issue that we're slowly moving towards um so i'll, I'll mention that and then i'll also say that um is really important i don't think we're at a point right now cuz i think we can keep pushing the ceiling but eventually we're going to get to the point where the united states is going to have to figure out what the hell they're going to do yeah i think it's incredibly important for anyone who's listening as you're investing continue to invest international as well um so just kind of like moving and moving from debt to just investing invest internationally because you never know what could happen to in the United States what could happen to other countries right you want to be diversified and we didn't get on the topic of like US currency and the dollar and all that stuff being like the um the reserve currency but that's another challenge that I think we're going to approach I don't think anytime in the near future but eventually people are going to start moving to different currencies because they feel that it's more stable or maybe it's better for uh the entire world not just the western side of the world um but when you're going and diversifying globally you have US stocks, US bonds, you have um bonds and stocks from international right so not just UK and Asia and Japan and all that right like you also have like develop developing markets as well so um not to go on a tangent in that direction but if you're like okay i hear you guys what do i do now that should be your takeaway that should be your homework is to make sure that the companies that you own you not only own their debt but you also own the equity of other companies outside of the US. I think right. we I forget about that. No, I think that I think that's a great I think that's a great way to say it. I feel like not I think it, it, you don't just even have to have equity. I think even just having equity on its own. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, it could be a problem, right? Cuz think about it this way. I know a lot of people don't want to go into this path of thinking, but mm-hmm. let's say the US increases its taxes significantly. Right. Pay off all of its bonds. What happens to those corporations? Right. Right? I mean their their valuations are probably going to drop significantly because people are going to be 
uh, people are going to have to pay a lot more for goods and maybe they won't be able to buy it from those corporations anymore. So, I mean, there's also the argument that, let's say, businesses become more decentralized. Mm -hmm. Businesses become, instead of relying on massive corporations, let's say we have smaller operations, mm -hmm. right? Let, let's say you, let's say we, let's say smaller people start competing with Apple and they produce a product that's much better than Apple and they don't want to sell it to Apple mm -hmm. and their direct competition. I mean, anything that that's what a disruptor is, right? I mean, anything can be disrupted at the end of the day. I think a lot of the industries that people are investing in right now, they're kind of taking it for granted that they'll be here 50 years from now. Right. That was a really good point. And a lot of the students that I have, like uh, my Bulletproof students, I tell them all the time, you can go and you can buy those individual companies. You can buy our all large cap um, you know, companies that are the largest in, in the country. You can buy technology. You can buy, you know, the ones that we hear every single day. You can go and buy those people or those companies. Yeah. However, you also have mid cap, you have small cap, you have micro, like, you want to make sure you're investing across all of them because you never know which one is going to outperform. And to your point, you don't know if a disruptor can come in that might be a small company that could eventually become a large company, but they outperform the Apple's Amazon of the world. It's not um, even outperformance. That's the important thing here. I think it's more about decreasing their market share, right? Mm -hmm. right. A Apple can They're get outperformed and maybe it won't get destroyed, but if they start taking their market share for, for, for the products that they offer, I mean, it changes everything. Right. Yeah. And I can see now, like a lot of people are opening up their eyes to investing or not investing, but maybe investing with their dollars, like buying from companies that are smaller, mid-sized companies. People don't want to, there's a lot of people that don't want to buy from some of the largest companies out there. They yeah. instead want to shop small or like, the fact that we have businesses where they could have easily gone to Vanguard Fidelity to learn whatever from their videos or whatever, but they much rather learn from us, the yeah. small people, <laughs> like, yeah. um, you know, small mid-sized companies. So I think, especially with social media, it's opening up the eyes to these small businesses. And yeah, like there might be an opportunity for us, I say us, but like, them those small companies to take over market share so yeah really good conversation i know um i only wanted to hold you for 30 minutes we're we're at 50 really good conversation i feel like i can talk to you forever but um i know the audience probably has a lot going on they probably have things to do so let's cut it here and for anyone who is like hey like where can i find raja where can i follow him like if i want to tap into his his knowledge what can i do where can I find you? Uh, so I post, I have a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to. It's rajatsonifinance.com. Just R-A-J-A-T-S-O-N-I finance.com. Um, I post on Twitter. It's rajatsonifinance, but the the finance doesn't have an I. So it's rajatsonifinance, I guess. And then on, on Instagram, it's rajatsonifinance. Nice. I also, I also have a course. Uh, and I know a lot of people are interested in just learning the basics getting their financial literacy uh started I, I think the the course is well i mean my goal with the course was to aim it at individuals who are beginners so uh i spoke about credit building credit decreasing expenses is expenses increasing income um it's i think it'll help a lot of people i actually explained gic's in depth in there i explained interest rates time value of money all that important stuff um, that can actually be accessed through, uh, if you go to courses.rajatsonifinance.com, you can get that course. You can see the preview very recent, very, I, I think in my opinion, very, uh, very well priced for the value that you're getting. It's only a hundred bucks, but I think you could probably provide 10, $15,000 of value over time. So. There you go, guys. Um, so guys tap in with them if you need help understanding finance um you know basic personal finance you want to get your money to, in order you know where to find them i'll make sure all that's within the show notes uh but with that we're out if you're listening and you got any value from this episode please go to wherever you're listening to the podcast you yeah you the person listening right now go to the platform leave a rating and review 
And I will, if you leave a rating or review, what I would do is I'll read off the reviews during the next podcast episode. With that, we're out. Raja, thank you again for coming on and dropping your knowledge on the community. But with that, that's the end of the episode. You guys have a great one.